great pleasure and uh, honor to introduce you Professor Marshall from Australia. He's an expert in autoimmunity in Australia and he is giving us a talk about the autoimmune diseases or autoimmune diseases that come to a VDR nuclear receptor agonist. Professor Marshall, of course. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, 30 years ago, when I first started getting interested in autoimmune diseases, one of the things that really fascinated me about all the autoimmune diagnoses is how similar they are. What we've done on this chart is we've plotted comorbidities amongst the inflammatory diagnoses in a study cohort, a seven-year study that we've been running. And um, what I wanted to point out was you've got, for example, thyroiditis, is a very common comorbidity with other diseases. And if you take um, diseases like uh, Sjogren's, you'll find that Sjogren's is often associated with osteopenia, uh, with, uh, um, uh, let me see, I'm trying to follow the yellow one, sorry, um, CFS and some of the other uh, chronic uh, immune diseases. We did the same com comorbidity analysis looking at some studies from PubMed, and the results are the same as, as we saw with our study that very rarely do we find people, most of these are adults, very rarely do we find people with, an auto, with a single autoimmune diagnosis. It's usually uh, a, a complex of uh, chronic diseases. We have added uh, non-autoimmune uh, diseases. We've got asthma, uh, anorexia, anxiety, and uh, bipolar, and some of the other cancer, and some of the other um, chronic diseases that are commonly associated with uh, autoimmune diagnoses. But in, when we've been exploring infection in autoimmunity in the past, we have really been crippled by the uh, need to um, actually cul uh, culture uh, microbes. When we found microbes, really the only way that we could uh, identify them was either by culturing them or by um, finding them under the microscope by happenstance. And what we can do now is we can actually find the DNA of the microbes. So even in single cell samples, we can analyze a single cell and we can pull out from that single cell if there's any microbial DNA that exists within that cell. The NIH Microbiome Project was started some years ago and is yielding some very interesting results. The salivary microbiome, for example, this is the saliva of healthy uh, adults. And um, this is a study that was done at Max Planck. And the salivary microbiome um, includes, admittedly, at low concentration, but Yersinia, Porphyrimonas, Neisseria, um, Streptococcus, known pathogens. And yet, normal, healthy saliva contains the DNA of these species. You can't necessarily culture it, but the DNA is there. The species are there in some form. Man is, is really living in homeostasis with a microbial community that is the scope of which is just starting to uh, dawn upon um, medicine. Here is, uh, for example, the um, microbiome from a, a hip joint. Um, and what you've got from this hip joint was primarily Lysobacter. Uh, Lysobacter is commonly found in, um, in um, for example, biofilms. Um, and uh, Proteobacterium, Methylobacterium. But look here, hydrothermal vent eubacterium, a eubacteria that was found uh, previously in hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean with a higher frequency than Staphylococcus. Fascinating what the microbiome means. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, if we look at some of the um, uh, studies which show intracellular um, microbial um, artifacts, this uh, study from uh, 1989 was done by Wirosco's group at uh, Columbia University. And they used transmission electron microscopy um, and staining to identify communities of microbes um, which stained as microbes but living within the cytoplasm. Now what's fascinating about this is these are phagocytic cells. This was a lymphocyte taken from the eye of a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis patient. And the Columbia studies looked at a number of other diseases as well, Crohn's, and uh, sarcoidosis. Now, we've been able to use light microscopy to uh, show that as, the, as a whole blood ages, 
the cells that are infected, this looks like a monocyte that's infected with its nucleus, um, the cytoplasm of this cell is very heavily infected and as the blood ages, as it loses nutrients, the uh, cytoplasm bursts apart and these really thin polymers, bacterial polymers are released into the environment, um, uh, into the blood environment. Well, what we did some years ago was to find out or to figure out that um, the, the key to persistent pathogen survival in Homo sapiens is the VDR nuclear receptor. Because in Homo sapiens, and only in Hobo, Homo sapiens, not even in some of the higher primates, but only in Hobo, Homo sapiens, there is one nuclear receptor, the VDR nuclear receptor, which transcribes genes for TLR2, as well as cathelicidin, and to a lesser degree, beta defense and antimicrobial peptides. All of these are essential to the intracellular innate immune defenses, innate immunity. If innate immunity fails, then the cytokine cascade that will be caused by innate immunity will cause uh, flow on to the adaptive immune system uh, with the uh, generation, random generation, of antibodies. Knocking out the VDR allows these pathogens to persist, but it causes human chronic disease. If we look at some of the uh, nasties that do that, uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a persistent infection in latent TB. That knocks out the VDR. In this particular study, they found it downregulated about 3.3 fold. Uh, we now know a lot more about why MTB knocks out the VDR. Uh, it's a different protein take but it still needs to knock the VDR out. Borrelia knocks out the VDR. Uh, Borrelia spirochetes uh, downregulate uh, VDR nuclear receptor by 50 fold. And then Epstein Barr virus the virus which I think has been associated with more autoimmune disease than, than any other. Uh, a very interesting study just came out from Yananamundra um, which showed that uh, Epstein-Barr virus uh, knocks out VDR as a function of cell line and that what's particularly interesting is that one and a half years in the lymphoblastoid cell lines, the immature cell lines, you knock down the VDR by about 15 times. That's exactly the behavior that a persistent pathogen needs in order to ensure its persistence. The big daddy of them all, of course, is HIV. HIV, the TAC protein from HIV, uh, binds to the human VDR nuclear receptor, and it steals this receptor to recognize its own LTR and help it express HIV RNA within the cells, within the nucleus of the cells. Now the interesting thing about HIV is it's a very simple genome. The, the genome transcribes for only 17 proteins, and yet these 17 proteins have over 3,000 interactions with the human metabolome, human proteins and enzymes. Many, many human metabolites are affected by the metagenome, the persistent pathogens that live within the phagocytic cells. The sum total of all the interactions gives rise to the totality of symptoms suffered during chronic disease. For example, if a certain person has genes from bug A and genes from bug B, which are expressing proteins and, and uh, other components, proteins, proteases, in the uh, cytoplasm, that might well lead to disease X. Whereas to get disease Y, you might need genes from bug C, D, E, F, and with the absence of bug G. This is a totally new concept in medicine. Medicine still works on the postulates of Koch, which is one bug, one disease. But now we understand it's not that. The genomes interact. The genomes accumulate gradually during life, the metagenome, incrementally shutting down the, in the innate immune system. Genes from the accumulated uh, metagenome determine the clinical uh, disease sim symptomatology. And uh, if we take the salivary metagenome, which is much bigger than HIV, we've got about 50,000 proteins instead of 17. And so we basically end up with an imponderable complexity, which is what you see in all the autoimmune syndromes. So the catastrophic failure of the human metabolism that we see in chronic inflammatory disease, which at first glance appears to be so, verse, so diverse, is actually due to a common underlying mechanism, a ubiquitous microbiota 
which has evolved to persist in the cytoplasm of nucleated cells by knocking out the VDR nuclear receptor. So what do we do about it? Well, obviously, we find a VDR agonist which uh, will switch the VDR back on again. And it turns out there is a drug in the pharmacopoeia that will do that, Olmosart and Medoxamil, and uh, here is how it does it. I don't have time to go into that. When you do that, over a period of about five years, you can reverse uh, just about every autoimmune diagnosis. We have diagnoses here starting rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uveitis, psoriasis, scleroderma, multiple sclerosis, right down to diabetes insipidus. And uh, these are the results of our study, which was uh, reported by um, my colleague Tom Perez uh, in Porto last year. And we were basically able to show that between 18 and 53 months of therapy, 81% of the cohort experienced reduced disease and symptoms. That's what happens. Suddenly when you give them the VDR agonist, they become sensitive to antibiotics, low-dose antibiotics again, and the disease processes start to reverse. So I'm at my 10-minute mark. Um, I just wanted to say that we're collaborating with West China Hospital to bring our discoveries to China, and we're actively looking for any other collaborations within Asia. Thank you.